Uh, welcome everybody. Um, it's very, very good to be back. This is absolutely my favourite conference. Um, due to the smart, insightful audience who typically fall asleep in the back row and write some code in the middle road and pretend they're watching me on the front row. Um, so today I'm going to talk about performance tuning. And this is going to be uh, a methodology talk. It will not be deep dive, diving into lots of detailed tooling or anything like that. So if that's what you came for, then I will not be offended if you leave. The talk may not be as humorous as other talks you've seen me give. If that also offends you, you can leave. For those of you who don't know me, I am the Diabolical Developer. And I do some stuff. That's me on the Twitters. I run a small company with my co-founder who's sitting at the front here, Kirk Pepperdine, called J Clarity. We use machine learning to try and solve nasty performance problems in Java and JVM systems. It's an awful lot of fun. Uh, I help run various open community projects at OpenJDK and for uh, Java standards. And um, I cause trouble, like I did today when I arrived here 10 minutes before my talk. Don't tell Stefan. So let's get into this. What on earth is performance anyway? As far as your end users are concerned, it's pretty much the bottom three there on that, on that list. They're usually concerned about some sort of throughput. You know, they want uh, a million transactions per second. Or if you're Twitter, you just halve that transaction rate as soon as you open up the 280 character limit. Go ask the Twitter engineers how they felt about that decision <laughs> one day. So it makes for an interesting conversation. Latency is also very important for many of you. So if that login screen doesn't respond in one second most of the time, you know, you get the angry user on the end of the phone. And in of increasing importance, especially in this brave new world of virtualization, containerization, microservice, and cloud, is the resource usage. So a lot of you are being asked to deploy Java applications that are now running on hundreds, if not thousands, of JVMs, all which are meant to be fairly small microservices, and Amazon financiers are rubbing their hands with glee because every time you deploy a Java app, they make a ton of money. And so your management quite often now is starting to ask you, can we make Java smaller? Can we make the application that you've built on top of Java smaller? Can we run it in a smaller heap? Start performance tuning, please. So I'm going to cover these eight things in rapid fire because I've got 66 slides and only 50 minutes to cover them in. The first four sections are the very, very important ones. Those are the ones that you need to take notes on, memorize, think about carefully, take away home with you. It's the methodology. It's how we go about performance tuning. And how we go about performance tuning at JClarity is we've got about 40 or 50 years combined experience in applying a fairly rigorous scientific methodology to finding bottlenecks and, how to, and then going out and solving them. So Kirk Pepperdine sitting in the corner invented this methodology goodness knows how many years ago, probably before Java even started. And we've applied it to everything from tiny microservices all the way to massive data grids, compute clusters, so on and so forth. And it just works. Right? So th this is the thing you're going to want to take away from this talk. The following four sections are all kind of tactical tools and things you can use today but they may not be the right tools tomorrow, and they may not actually be the right tools for your specific application. So just like going on to Stack Overflow and copying and pasting that random person's code, please take anything that I've written on these slides as they are intended. They are not specific tuning advice for your application. And if I catch any of you using my specific advice on these slides to tune your applications, a puppy or a kitten may die. So performance is really all about managing these things, resources. Who here is a Catan player? Woo -hoo. My wife has been banned from Catan. She bet the number one player on Xbox and the on ongoing storm after that, the Twitter storm and the abusive tweets and things just, uh, just meant it was too much. Great game though. So it's all about managing your resources. How much hardware do you have? How much CPU do you have? How much memory? How much networking capacity? How much bandwidth? 
What's your hard disk like? Are there two disk controllers? Is there one? Are you running in a container? Are you running on a virtualized hypervisor? Is that hypervisor lying to you? All these questions and more need to be answered. Unfortunately, most of you are now being pushed onto virtualized environments or to cloud environments. So show of hands, who here is now deploying to some sort of cloud environment for production? The super advanced crowd at DevOps, see, half of you. And how many of you are running either on a virtualized uh, operating system, so some sort of VM, or a Docker container? Wow, even more of you. You poor, poor people. <laughs> so the cloud sucks. Data, these, these remote data centers with their poor bandwidth and the fact you've got to share everything with Netflix is just useless and annoying from a performance perspective. Yes, you can horizontally scale more easily. That is the one overwhelming benefit of doing all this virtualization stuff. Unfortunately, you now get less CPU, less memory, less network, less reliability, less disk control, less all the nice resource things that you used to rely on in the 2000s, which made Java go fast. So all of a sudden, your individual instances of Java now suck from, from a performance perspective. Right? And this is why we at JClarity are enjoying this phase at the moment, because we get to make a lot of money. It's very important. So, a few little nasty facts about cloud. Uh, in a typical bulletproof data center, reliable data center at one of the big banks, they typically talk about five or six nines reliability. You're lucky if you get a single nine, if not two, from Amazon. Right? This is, this is a huge, huge issue if you're running any sort of mission critical application that, that relies on having decent uptime and, uptime and decent performance characteristics. If someone's DDoSing uh, your cloud provider, you're also being DDoSed. So make sure that you know, if you're hosting your application that it's not being hosted alongside, say, some alt-right group which is currently being hammered over in the US. Or Donald Trump's personal website, perhaps. People think that, oh, it's all about elasticity on cloud. We can just spin up boxes. Who here has tried spinning up more than 10 Amazon AWS instances and had that successfully execute in under a minute? None. Five minutes. Still none. 10. Gosh, isn't this brave new world great? I can go to my old data center and I can spin up 10, 10 bare metal boxes in under 10 minutes. But anyway. So the issue we're seeing with a lot of you, unfortunately, is that because you don't read your hardware manuals and you don't read your software manuals and you're not reading your Linux manuals, is that you're oversubscribing to these resources. We constantly see customers going, whoa, cool, we've got virtualized operating systems on this piece of bare metal. We're just going to allocate 16 gig of RAM to our virtualized operating systems forgetting that there's only 8 gig of physical RAM on the box. How many times does 16 go into 8? It's a pretty basic mathematical question, and quite often people get this wrong. Same goes for the CPU resources, the disks, so on and so forth. So rule number one, please be extremely careful about doing basic arithmetic. Make sure that the virtualized resources you're allocating actually map on nicely to the physical resources. And this at extremes includes things like making sure you understand how many physical sticks of RAM there are, for example. If you're allocating 8 gig of virtualized memory and that fits nicely into an 8 gig stick, assuming the operating system is mapping that nicely for you, that's a much better performance profile than that if that was mapped over four 2 gig sticks. So understanding little nuances like that, if you've got real performance critical applications, is important. It's also important to remember that the operating system and the hypervisor need some resources for management. So you can't just go and tightly pack in, say, 8 gig of virtualized memory into 8 gig of physical memory, because you've, got, you've forgotten that the operating system itself and the virtualization management software itself needs a little bit of that memory for it itself to work. Now, they pull all sorts of tricks, right? resource sharing, time boxing, uh, pinning things, all sorts of fun tricks. But at the end of the day, the math still speaks true. Don't over allocate. Very important. So here's my pro tip number one. Know exactly where your resources are. 
Who here knows where their cloud data center is? So that's about a tenth of the people who said they were deploying to cloud. Right, so that's number one piece of homework. Find out where your data center is. Find out what's actually running on that data center and what your production application is running on. That includes the network, the hard disk, all, that, all those features. Go talk to your local system administrator. They're not trolls. They're human beings just like you. And if you want to get into this whole DevOps movement, then you may have to be the first person to hand over that olive branch and make friends. It's really, really important. They actually have all this knowledge. And they usually guard it in a text document or a Microsoft Word document at worst. Um, and usually if you buy them enough coffee, they'll actually share that with you. Next section, what is performance tuning? So it's understanding about all the technology. And this is why people who are really good at performance tuning spend long careers in it. It's not just enough to kind of pretty much know how Java and the JVM works. It's about understanding the deep dive detail of how each of the garbage collectors work, how the just-in-time compiler works, how the JVM pushes down on the Linux scheduler, so on and so forth. And some of this is just hard-won, bitter knowledge through painful application deployments, reading through bug reports, chatting quite often to the core JVM engineers at Oracle, Red Hat, IBM, and so forth. Um, so if you want a career in this stuff, be prepared to spend a couple of years of really deep diving into some technical detail. It is an awful lot of fun, though. It's actually very, very rewarding, especially from a computer science perspective. It really, really brings you back to the core. Use a methodology. Whatever you do, do not light the black candles. Do not sacrifice the chickens. Do not sell your firstborn child, especially to the management. All right, try and use at least some sort of a rigorous, scientific, repeatable, rep rep reproducible process. And we'll go into the one that we use that we think is very successful. Only fix one thing at a time, very important. I'll harp on about this later. You need to understand your architecture. Where is everything physically located and how does it all logically talk to each other? What protocols are being used? Are you using things like SSL? Ooh, that has a performance overhead. Interesting. Well, are we doing that handshake every time or are we just doing it once, as an example? Understanding what the real requirements are. And this means going back to high school, at least high school statistics, maybe university level year one mathematics. So when end users say they want something to be really, really fast, what they tend to mean is that they want everything to happen under one second at about the 99th percentile of all of your response times that you have in a massive statistical curve. So at the very least, 99% of the time, Things should happen in a second. Screen should be snappy. Uh, things should come. Transactions should come back. Things should be responsive. So, when you're drawing that bell-shaped statistical curve that many people like to do, it's not the one in the middle that you care about. It's the one all the way up to the far, far end. And because I got here so late on the train, I don't. I can't show you one of those curves, but you can imagine it in your head. So you do need to know a little bit of math. You want some tools. You need to be able to load test your applications. And if you can't uh, split an AB off your actual live production traffic, and I highly recommend you do do that if you can. If you can't, then using a load tester such as JMeter or Gatling is quite useful. We really like JMeter when you're modeling user stories because it's absolutely fantastic about taking a user journey through a whole bunch of web pages or through a whole bunch of interactions and doing things like the user is confused by this page, so they kind of pause for five seconds as they figure out where the heck they're going. So you can really actually model how a user would use it. Gatling is awesome for system load testing. So if you're effectively trying to test Twitter and you just want to hammer 10 million transactions at an API, then Gatling is an awesome Scala-based, Java-based API to go do that. And all you're trying to do is just remove a bottleneck. And the bottleneck is the bit that oversubscribes to a resource. Right? Are you utilizing the CPU too much, the memory too much, the Java heap too much, the hard disk too much? What is, what is the blocker? What's the thing that's causing this performance complaint? And the key here is to only remove the biggest bottleneck one at a time. Because every single time you remove a bottleneck, 
and you rerun that load test, it's a completely brand new scenario. And you, generally speaking, have no idea what the effects on the downstream system or components are going to be. Okay. So a classic example is you fix your thread pool in your Java server, and all of a sudden the Java server now has 20 lovely threads to go talk to the database. Oh, the database was only configured to handle two requests at a time. And so the bottleneck now becomes the database. The overall impact on the system is that you actually managed to slow the whole thing down. Oops. That happens with performance tuning. Fix the bottle, biggest bottleneck. You may actually find yourself going backwards in terms of your result until, until you go fix the next one. But eventually, you'll get there. So pro tip number two, make sure you draw those logical and physical architecture diagrams. Sketch them on a whiteboard or use good old Microsoft Visio if your manager really insists. Uh, there's lots of great collaborative drawing tools now, not Google Docs. And learn some basic statistics. So you need to understand your distribution curves and what standard deviations are and significance and things like that. Now we're going to talk a little bit about time. And I'm going to run a fun little experiment. Humans suck at measuring time. They're absolutely terrible. You're horrible at it. And I'm going to prove this to you now. So I'm going to get everyone to close, in a, in a few seconds, I'm going to get everyone to close their eyes and count to 10 seconds and then raise their hand when they think they got to 10 seconds. No cheating, I'll be watching. <laughs> right, so on the count of three, I want you to close your eyes, count to 10 seconds, and then raise your hand when you've gotten to 10, okay? So one, two, three, go. Wow, some kids are fast out of the block, aren't they? Smattering around 9, 10, 11. Still going. Someone's using a force multiplier on the second. <laughs> Fantastic, you can all open your eyes. So that ranged from 5 seconds to about 17. What an amazing variance. And this is only over a tiny, tiny interval. So you have to understand that, especially when you're dealing with human beings, end users in particular, when they say something took a few seconds, they are lying to you. I'm not kidding. So never, ever, ever trust your users when they say anything about time. And don't trust yourself when it comes to time. Take the proper measurements. And you need to understand a little bit about human psychology as well. Unless you improve something by more than about 15 to 20% in terms of a latency, a human won't notice the difference. So when you see people going, wow, we optimized that web page, we got a 3% performance gain, nobody cares. You just wasted two or three weeks' work. Right? So make sure that the gains you're, you're getting are something that humans, in particular, can actually see. So time is a fun, fun topic, and we could probably give a three-hour talk on time. But you have to be aware of a few things when you're uh, measuring time in your systems. You have things like the NTP protocol, which will send some of your machines back in time. That's always a fun trick. Ooh, my transaction completed in minus two seconds. Awesome. All the hardware clocks lie to you. If you ask a uh, Linux laptop, all on different hardware, same Linux kernel, to tell you exactly how many uh, milliseconds it took to get to one second, they'll all give you a different number. So again, when you're running performance tests, Make sure you're running on hardware, which is pretty darn close to what you're running in production, because otherwise you're going to get different results, quite significantly different results. And there's the old adage of the more you measure, the more you're actually impacting the thing you're measuring. So you have to be extremely careful not to introduce jitter and lag into the thing that you're measuring by measuring it. And we call that either inbound or outbound flow measuring. And most people get it wrong. We, we got this wrong ourselves to begin with as well. You want to make sure that you're taking timings at each entry and exit point of your architecture. And because we're going back to the 2000s, we have a client-server architecture here because it's a much simpler scenario to walk through. So you want to measure at the JavaScript layer there at 1, then when it enters your servlet container at 2, exits that JDBC driver, hits your database, goes back through. And as long as you've got timing points for your transaction as it goes through, you know where the time is being spent. 
So you've already eliminated whether the problem is occurring in your front end, your middle tier, or your data store somewhere. Pretty simple, right? There's lots of good free tooling to do around this stuff. You can use uh, P6 Spy, for example, for your JDBC driver. There's a ton of open source and commercial tooling that you can buy, which will do bytecode weaving into your code to put timers in. Uh, we have one of those. Uh, usually, the database vendors have got lots of lovely tooling around that space, so it's never a problem. If you're doing really cool hipster microservice peer-to-peer -peer stuff and you're trying to trace the transaction timers for those, you're out of luck. This is why Karma is punishing you for being a hipster. There is no good solution for this yet. Uh, if somebody finds one, please let me know. There is a bit of an emerging standard called Open Tracing uh, or Open Trace uh, Open Tracing IO, which might help. You can just start with a simple timer. Won't bore you with that. So that's my pro trip number three. Make sure that you have these measurements in place, because if you don't, performance tuning, you're just performance tuning by guesswork, and you're relying on your human instinct on what time is. And as we've just proven, that's wrong. So make sure you get the timers. Also, make sure that you capture the uh, times for each run and you store them somewhere in a, in a data store. Doing that sort of historical analysis, you'll, you'll find is actually surprisingly important. Section number four. This is the very, very important section, the performance diagnostic model. Invented by Kirk Pepperdine there in the corner. You can go get your model when you print it out, signed by him afterwards. You have actors, which are either humans or systems, which do stuff, which pushes down on the application, which is your code. Your amazingly prematurely optimized code that you wrote those really specialized loops in and stuff. That then pushes down on the JVM. And basically, it pushes down on the JVM primarily in about three ways. One, memory, so allocating objects on the heap, and therefore garbage collection gets, kick, gets kicked off at some point. Uh, Utilizing threads, so if you're firing up thread pools or if you're using some sort of framework which uh, does its own threading, uh, that starts to use up Java threads. Some Java threads then map onto actual operating system threads, so that's using up resources. And you've got the just-in-time compiler, so if you've got code which is uh, running hot and the JIT believes it is something that it can go and optimize, uh, that then gets invoked. So, so on and so forth. You're also asking the JVM to do things like open up sockets, write to disk, uh, do all sorts of exciting activities. That all pushes down on the what we call the OS or hardware layer, and that includes your virtualization, your Docker containers, and your actual physical hardware. We just lump it all into one. Um, one of these days, I'll actually get around to splitting that into two, two sections, but for now, just you can just treat it as the same thing. So that's the mental model you want to have in your head, and everything pushes down from the top. And typically, each bottom layer knows nothing about the layer above it. Right? The operating system doesn't know how the internals of Java works. It doesn't care. The JVM doesn't actually understand what application code it's being run. It's just a bunch of bytecodes. You then go through this very simplistic decision tree. And I will stress that this is an incredibly simplified model of what is actually really a complex spider web decision matrix which is Kirk's brain, which we've now replaced in software. So yes, we are part of the AI machine learning wave kicking everyone out of their jobs. Sorry, Kirk. Basically, what you want to do, this is the key question you always want to ask yourself, what the heck is my CPU doing? If the CPU is busy, that's probably a reasonably good thing. But is it kernel or system busy? Is it executing really low-level kernel system activities? Or is it what we call user busy? So is it, is it doing user space activities? In other words, is the JVM or the application forcing the CPU to do a lot of work? And if it's not busy, that's the bottom left-hand corner. Why the heck is it not busy? Your users are screaming down the phone saying your website isn't responding. Your CPU is not doing any work. Probably means your application is not doing any work. Interesting. That gives you a path to go down, doesn't it? So what we do is we go and look at what the CPU is doing, and that helps us guide us down this decision tree. And this is crucial to go through a process like this, because at 3 o'clock in the morning, when you're panicking, and you're trying to read through logs and look at your source code, and you're guessing, oh, was it that string builder or that string buffer we wrote? Or was it hibernate? Probably was. 
Remember what I said about not taking any specific performance tuning advice, so it may not be Hibernate. I have seen some people read the 800-page Hibernate book and get it right. Not many. So what do we do? How do we go look at the CPU? I'm only going to talk about Linux, because if any of you people, are, I was going to say something rude then, are running on Windows, or yeah, exactly what, good, thank you, or Mac, or heaven forbid, even Solaris, actually I'll give you a pass for Solaris, although they're killing it, which is a bit sad. Um, then you're tough, you're a bit out of luck. There's a free command line tool called VMStack. You just say, I want to run it for interval, and I need to learn to spell, clearly. And the results get broken up to a whole bunch of sections. And it looks a little like this. So we're going to ignore most of this, because that will take, take the talk far too long to go through. But on the right-hand side there, you've got what the CPU is doing. And it's doing some user stuff and some system stuff, or it's idle. And I'm going to ignore wait, because that's another little semi-complicated topic that I don't have time for today. So either the CPU is busy doing user stuff, or it's busy doing system stuff, or it's actually idle. And in this particular example, it's idle. Right? It's spending over 90% of its time doing pretty much nothing. Now remember, you have to correlate this data with an actual performance complaint that's coming. Right, so you've got to. This is why people actually continuously measure what the CPU is doing, because that way they've got that capture of that data, and when the user says, "Oh, by the way, 10 minutes ago I experienced this performance problem," you can go back 10 minutes, look at this data, and go, "What was the CPU doing during that performance complaint?" So it's really important you capture that at the time that the performance complaint was happening. It's also important to only care about looking at this if there is a performance complaint. If your CPU is going at 90% 24-7 and no one's complaining about the performance, this is good. You've bought a really expensive CPU, you want it to work. right? Make Intel actually work for its money, or AMD, because they usually don't. Oh. So, tactic number four. What is your CPU doing with the extra bit at the time the performance complaint or the bottleneck actually occurred? Very important. Ooh, I'm running out of battery on my phone. This will be exciting. Will I run out of my clicker speed? I must go faster. So, if you remember the decision tree, which I'll show you again in, in a second, if we're going up the CPU is doing lots of system activity path, and there's kind of some fudge factor on what the percentage of this should be, and that changes between versions of JVM and the operating system, and if you're not doing Java or JVM performance tuning, it actually differs if you're Ruby or .NET or whatever. It's doing a whole bunch, it could be doing a whole bunch of things, right? It could be one of these uh, broad categories which is causing the problem. It might be context switching. In other words, something else on that box is fighting with your Java for that CPU. And we used to see this a lot with the typical client server applications, because people would get the bright idea of going, we need to co-locate that database really close to our Java app for speed. And then they install the largest Oracle database known to man, on the same box as their poor little Java web app. And if anyone's ever run Oracle databases in production and seen what Oracle does to resources, it's pretty much what Oracle does out there in the marketplace. <laughs> it will eat you alive. So if you see lots of context switching, have a look at what other processes are fighting with your Java. And on other slightly rarer occasions, you might find that Java's fighting with itself. And that's usually the fault of someone who's decided to write their own concurrency framework and who has not read Brian Gertz's book. Who here has written their own concurrency framework? Did you read Brian's book? Yes, one of you did. Fantastic. The other person is called Java Concurrency in Practice. It's fantastic. So there's all sorts of stuff going on. It could be disk writing, right? You could have something which is writing 80 meg of logging data to disk per second, so your disk controller is completely tied up and that's causing the whole box to slow down. And, and you'll, you'll see that really clearly. In fact, VMstat will even tell you. Right? Look at the BI and BO columns. Right? That's your disk I.O., just so you know. You've got swap space column there and you've also got how your memory is being run. And you've got the little uh, CS column there on the right-hand side next to CPU. That's your concept, context switching. If you see that thing going north of about 10,000 on most Linux systems, chances are that's your problem. 
So I won't, I won't deep dive into the technical details for all these because, as I said, this is an overview talk. But if you want to understand more about the deep dive detail of how you read things like VMstat, come and find myself or Kirk after the talk. We'll go through it with you. Covered all that. So just in case you've forgotten on the diagram, that's that one. So if your CPU is what we call system dominant, then go get out your cheap Linux tools, VMstat, NetStat, IOStat, so on and so forth, and go see what, what was happening. Now remember what I said previously about capturing this data during the time the event actually occurred? So it's not just a case that you can log on to the, to the terminal and start running these tools and getting an answer. You need to make sure that you're working with your system administrators, or if you're DevOps Pro, you, you do this yourself, and that you're capturing this data continuously, 24-7. And to capture low-level data like this from a Linux operating system is extremely cheap. Okay, there's a whole bunch of performance counters that Linux gives you. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny overhead. So we always recommend you just go and do it. So buy the cheap command line tools. If you really, really, really need to spend some money, you can come and see me after the talk. <laughs> we, we, have, we have some solutions for you. Oracle has been a good role model for us. If the CPU is heading towards the user dominance, so we're going towards the green bit, then we want to, to, check, to we want to check something very quickly. And the reason why we want to check this thing so quickly is twofold. One is because Java memory issues are probably the root cause of about 60% of the performance complaints that we've seen at JClarity. So I'd say we've seen now over, probably over 10,000 alerts coming out of our systems. 60% of the time, it's some sort of GC issue. So it actually dominates. Most people don't realize this. It's the hidden secret uh, or the hidden uh, pain point of Java today. And the reason is because Java is being asked to go very small, microservice, or extremely large, something like data grids. And people just don't know how to tune the garbage collectors, or the garbage collectors just don't know how to work out of the box to support this new paradigm. That's why we're seeing it. But what you can do is you can actually take a garbage collection log by using the flags I've put up there. Not, ja not for Java 9, by the way. If you want the Java 9 flags, you can subscribe to my private mailing list for £13.99 per month. Just joking. Uh, we'll, we'll send that out in a, in a later slide update. And you can take a look at, at, at the logs very quickly. And in about three or four minutes, you will know whether it is GC, which is the problem, which in other words is JVM, the JVM box down there, or if it's your application that's the problem. So again, we're just following a methodology here, trying to narrow down what the root cause is. Where is this thing coming from? So, here we have an example, and by the way, ours is not the only tool, so please don't see this as a commercial pitch. There's GC, uh, GC Viewer uh, HP JMeter, which is another free open source tool to read these logs. You'll get extremely similar graphs to this. Okay, so there is free tooling out there. I know developers hate paying for things. That big red dot up there is a 43 second stop the world pause. Oops. That is a pretty big performance complaint. And for those of you who don't know what stop the world means, it means stop the world. The entire JVM stops dead. So your whole application just freezes. So again, if we've walked down this path, the CPU is doing lots of user activity, and we open up our GC log and we see that, we know what the performance problem is. It's garbage collection. And there's a whole bunch of stuff we can do to go fix that. Right? But please don't go to Stack Overflow to fix your garbage collection problems. Please, please, please don't do that. Maybe it's poor throughput. This graph is showing the percentage of time that the JVM is spending doing garbage collection instead of actually allowing your application to continue doing useful work. And you can see there's a whole bunch of spikes and banding that go above the 10% mark. And we argue that if you go above 10%, that means your GC is just doing overtime, right? Again, it means that there's something misconfigured, and this is going to then add an overhead, right? A cost, a latent, almost like a latency cost to every single transaction that goes through your JVM, right? It's just this, this, this overhead that you're just, you're just having to pay for. So that's one graph you can look at. Your heap might simply be too small. So what's happening here is that the heap has been set to about 450 meg, and the application starts up, starts doing work, and then it starts doing a full GC just about every 0.1 of a second, <laughs> end on end. So 
that thick red line is actually made up of hundreds of individual full GCs. Right. Now the interesting thing is that the full GCs are actually able to bring the amount of liveness or the amount of live objects in the heap down to a, a, a level playing field. So it's not actually a memory leak, interestingly enough. It might, well, it might be, but it's not looking like one at this stage because we're actually able to get back down to a stable state. But there's just no room for it to move, right? There's no room for more live objects to grow in that heap. So for this particular use case, you just need to double the size of your heap or stop producing so many objects. One of, one of two problems. If you see this, it means you do not have a garbage collection problem. Almost certainly not. This is what we call the sawtooth pattern, and this indicates a very healthy application. So at this point, you can go back to your decision tree, cross out JVM, and head across to the application node. Okay, hope, hope, that, hope that makes sense. So this is a type of pattern you typically want to see in your health, healthy JVMs. This is a memory leak. So we're doing lots of regular full GCs, but you can see that over time it's going up towards the right-hand side. Now this is a pretty long log, this is about three or four days worth, and I would say in about a week's time, this JVM is going to crash with an out-of-memory error. And also over time, its performance is slowly going to degrade. So when people start complaining that, oh, the app just seems to be getting a little bit slower every day, then if you see this kind of pattern in your GC logs, again, it's actually a GC problem. A lot of people want to know how to find memory leaks. You can just use the free tool Visual VM. Visual VM comes with your JDK download if you're using Java 8 or less. And you can just download it from, I think, visualvm.github.io or something for Java 9 onwards. What you want to do is you want to look for the object age. So how many generations is this thing in? And if, is it alive in all of these generations? If it is, you look for the highest one. That's your most likely candidate. You then have to execute Visual VM's glorious user interface. You need to check, tick the hidden checkbox in the top right-hand corner. It's a checkbox as opposed to a radio button. We do not know why. This opens up a magical panel which has another checkbox called Record Allocation Stack Traces. You will want to switch this on because this will tell you the line of your Java code which is creating all of these objects which are living in all these generations. And yes, it will be your code that is causing the memory leak. Almost guaranteed. If you manage to find that, that Java itself is causing a memory leak, then I'm personally willing to pay you 50 pounds. It is extremely rare. So do, do call me up on it if you find one. So just visually, Visual VM, fire it up. Press on the Memory Profiler button. See that Settings checkbox top right-hand corner? Make sure you've opened that up. Make sure you record allocation stack traces. And what you'll end up doing is, once you've taken a memory profile, is you'll get a lovely screen like this. Concurrent hash map entry was the thing which was basically leaking. But the code, our source code, Hawkshaw, which is a little application that we have to produce nasty memory problems like this, was actually the root cause. So now we can go into that line of code and we can start fixing the problem. A word of warning with memory profilers, several words of warning. They will heavily impact the thing that you are measuring. So again, it pays to have a clone of production or take a node out of production and run this on that as opposed to running it on production. You have to think carefully about your sampling rates. So all memory profilers will do some sort of sampling. You need to make sure the sampling rate is appropriate to the rate of objects that are coming into your JVM. So you actually do genuinely capture what's going on in your JVM and you're not just capturing only you know, a one-off one, one -off event, so on and so forth. Um, all the different profilers will all tell you slightly different things. So um, sometimes it pays to use a couple of different profilers if you're not getting a clear result. Most of the IDEs, Eclipse, IntelliJ, and NetBeans all come with free profilers. So you don't have to go pay for one. If it's not the JVM, so if we saw that sawtooth pattern, we then want to go to the green box, which is the application. So it's likely that application code is the problem, which is quite rare. And the reason why it's rare is because Java's JIT is exceptional. I think something over a thousand person years engineering effort has gone into the JIT. Nobody truly understands it anymore. 
which is probably why it's being replaced by Graal, because at least you can interrogate it with a Java API and make some sense out of it. But if you ever do manage to capture Cliff Click or any of his early cohorts who helped write the JIT, um, then uh, he, he, he can take you through an interesting tour. So there's just a few optimizations. This is just a subset. And the most powerful of these is called method inlining. And the key thing here is to just write your source code in a nice, dare I say it, software craftsmanship, Uncle Bob, solid principles manner, which means short, sharp methods that do one thing and one thing well. The interesting side effect of this is that usually those methods are less than 35 bytecodes, which means they are eligible for method inlining. Uh -huh. If you can method inline something, that means the JIT has got a much larger playing field of optimizations it can play with. So very, very important to go do this. There's some tooling to help you figure out how on earth about you go doing this. So I'll go into that shortly. So 35 bytecodes. Again, there's some free tooling which will help you see that when you uh, look at your class file after you've compiled it, what methods are 35 bytecodes or less. And the default rule, by the way, is that this method must need to be executed about 10,000 times in order to be eligible to be jitted, unless it's a really, really small method, right? Something like less than six byte codes. They only need to be run about 250 times before the JIT can pick them up and start running them. That's really handy with getters, setters, or really small mathematical calculations that you want to run really quick. I'm just going to walk through a little example here. Who here has done fizz, fizz fuzz or fizz buzz for their interview? Did you pass? <laughs> Only two people said they passed. Uh, the honesty here is wonderful. So here's a typical Java enterprise -y version of fizz fuzz. Here's the first half of the code. Here's the second half of the code. Uh, I, I do assure you that you can run this code. It is actually correct. And this is kind of what I'd expect uh, you know, a midweights or even a junior Java developer to be able to knock up on, on, a, on a coding test. The just-in-time compiler takes all of this code, all of this nice, readable, verbose code, which is actually how you sh probably should write it, not necessarily this particular problem, but most Java code, and it turns it into that, under the hood. Does this automatically. Right? So you don't need to do all of these premature optimizations that Stack Overflow and old Java manuals tell you to do. JIT, really, I'm, I'm really serious about this, the JIT will do this stuff for you, and it is Far, far better than most humans. So why do I have to inline the variables if the compiler can do that too? Why do you have to inline variables if the compiler can do that too? In the previous slide, you said that uh, it's good to inline variables. Can the compiler do that as well? Sorry, the method inlining technique I'm talking about is something that the JIT does for you. Okay. So I, I, I apologize, I wasn't clear there. So method inlining is a JIT technique. And what actually happens is that you have class A, which say calls a getter or a setter from class B, and under the hood, so during the JIT compilation phase, it takes that getter and sucks it into class A and makes the, makes the method in class A bigger with all that extra code. And that gives it more code to play with, more code to optimize. Okay. Right, where was I? Another little fun game that the JIT pulls. Who here can tell me how fast it takes to create a million Java objects? What was the guess there? Uh, zero, seconds. zero seconds. Zero seconds is correct. Java is super fast. Why is Java super fast? Because O never escapes that for loop. And the just-in-time compiler goes, cool, doesn't escape the for loops, not needed. Bye-bye, kills it. Right, so this is why when you're trying to do your own micro benchmarking, micro benchmarking is really, really hard. Right, there is a framework called the Java Micro uh, Benchmarking Framework (JMH), which is actually what you should do if you want to use this stuff. Right, now I'm running behind time, so I'm going to go really quick. NetBeans or VisualVM also has an execution profiler. So if you need to find out what application code is burning that CPU, which can which can happen if you're using if you're doing some sort of CPU intensive calculations, open up open up the execution profiler, look for the big red bar at the top. Remember to click the magical settings checkbox in the record allocation stack trace, and the execution profiler will tell you what your Java not don't need to record allocation stack trace, apologies. 
NetBeans will tell you, or VisualVM will tell you, what your Java source code is, is creating all this uh, weight on the CPU, effectively. Again, if you use an execution profiler like this, so JProfiler, NetBeans, whatever, it will have a heavy impact on the JVM that you're trying to attach to. So again, try and do this in test, and you'll be better off. If you want to have a tool which will tell you whether you're 35 byte codes or less, there is a fantastic free tool called JitWatch. It has a three pane editor, your source code, the Java byte code, and then the actual machine code. So go to git, github, adopt OpenJDK, and under there is a tool called JitWatch written by a guy called Chris Newland, who is just absolutely fantastic. And here's a, a quick sample of the Java Micro Benchmark Harness written by Alexei Shipolev, who used to be Oracle's and now Red Hat's uh, Java performance guru. This is a tool you want to use if you want to micro benchmark your code, because it will do stuff like take into account what JIT will do and what the garbage collector will do, so it gives you more accurate readings of, what, of how much time your code actually takes to run. So the last pro tip is just write solid code, small methods that do one thing and one thing well, Typically, that means it'll be less than 35 byte codes, which typically means it'll actually fit nicely into the just -in -time, what the just-in-time compiler can do for it. So, if, it's not, if the CPU is not system dominant and the CPU is not user dominant, so it's not the, it's not the uh, garbage collector and it's not your application code running hot, and the CPU is idle, then you need to figure out why. And there's lots and lots of reasons why this can happen, right? Missized mis thread pools, uh, asynchronous frameworks uh, where the response doesn't come back, ordinary re request response where the response doesn't come back, uh, database has gone down, therefore nothing's coming back, so on and so forth, right? Or internally inside the JVM, it can be things like deadlock threads, live lock threads, and so on. So what you generally want to do is you want to reach for what we call a thread profiler. So just from reference back to the diagram, we're down in that bottom corner. If you want to look, if it's, see if it's an external issue, then there's an awesome tool called Wireshark, uh, and I just prefer this because it's a graphical tool that you can easily filter types of traffic on. So you can filter the traffic, the ports, um, the protocol, so on and so forth. It's great for spying on your neighbor's Wi-Fi, and it's also quite useful for figuring out what's happening to the network. So wire requests and stuff not coming back in. If it's an internal JVM threading problem, then you need to understand some theoretical background of how the threading model works in Java. Here is a nice simple diagram. If you really want to find out how this stuff works, then Dr. Heinz Kibbutz is sitting in the front row here, and he runs probably the world's best uh, training course on Java concurrency. That, that's where I learned all my concurrency uh, knowledge from. So he's, he's the person you want to go talk to. But again, you can reach for NetBeans or VisualVM or any of these free profiling tools and just click on Tell me what the threads are doing. Yellow is waiting. Green means the thread's doing something. Red usually means it's blocked. Okay, it's that simple. So if you're seeing an awful lot of threads waiting in your, say, your servlet thread pool or your database thread pool, you know that they, that thing isn't responding properly. It'll also tell you information about that thread, so you can start tying it back to Java code. And deadlocks are automatically detected for you as well now, so you don't need to worry about that. And remember, this is just a free tool. So just go download it and run it. So use Visual VM or NetBeans if you want to use the cheap free tool. Uh, there are more expensive commercial tools that are a little bit more specialized and are possibly a little bit more accurate, um, including our own. In conclusion, do not tune by folklore. That is a really, really, really bad idea. And we've seen te teams spend months, even half a year, trying to chase down a performance problem because they're just guessing and they're costing themselves an awful lot of frustration and their company an awful lot of money. So try and follow a methodology like the diagram I showed you and apply the tools as and when needed. Some stuff we're doing to help. And I've got time for exactly one question because I have 30 seconds. That was well done, wasn't it? Who has one question? One question, can I see? I mean, no questions. I went quick. Oh, yes, in the front. Yes. Hi there. Uh, you mentioned uh, JVisual uh, Visual VM a lot. Mm -hmm. um, um, it also has the open source uh, mission control and the flight controller, mm -hmm. the flight recorder. Yes. How do they compare to Visual VM? 
So the question is, Visual VM is already open source, but Oracle has announced that they're opening an open sourcing uh, Java Flight Recorder and Mission Control. This is true, and Flight Recorder and Mission Control are both excellent tools, but they will only be allowed to be used in production, license-free, only after Oracle has actually completed open sourcing these tools. So at the moment, you can only use those tools in a development environment for free, else you have to pay. I would personally say that sometimes that tooling is worth paying for. Your management and your chief financial officer may not agree. <laughs> Technically, how do they compare? Java Flight Recorder is by far and away the most accurate recorder, it's in the name, of telemetry information out of the JVM that exists today. They have got hooks into the JVM that nobody else does, which means they can gather data in a less impactful manner than any of the other existing tools today. So it is something that we ourselves will be basing our machine learning off once it's become open sourced. So thank you, Oracle. There we go. Round of applause for Oracle for that one. It's really good. All right, so I will exit the stage now because we've run out of time for questions. But uh, you can find myself, Kirk or Heinz, uh, probably here for a few minutes and then outside. Thank you very much uh, again.